Hi, folks. We're back. Jimmy. Hi, buddy. <laughs> Hi, my pal, my, my best friend. Uh, hi out there. Good to see everybody again. Tell them about the buzz, the bell, or whatever you do. Oh, well, if you guys like what you see out there, make sure you always hit like, subscribe, and this way you get a chance to get that bell to ring whenever there's a new podcast with me and Larry. Back to you, Larry. Okay, and for the guy out there that's keeping track of my shirts, there's another one. A couple of hundred dollars. <laughs> and I can verify that. Anyway, um, like I said, I say it every week, I, I don't keep track no more of what, it, it, it's not in order. So I'm just going to be jumping around. And I have about 30 books with stories each each year, each month, and some each day, different stories that I go into. And that's why, that's why Nicholas Pelleggi, the guy who wrote Casino and Goodfellas and all that, and that's why after sitting down with me three or four times, he says, Larry, he says, um, this can't be a movie. He says, because it makes no difference how many voiceovers we do, it's still going to be a seven-hour movie. He says, it has to be a TV series. And that's what we're going to do now. We're, we, we're writing a TV series. Uh, the writer's strike was just over. Um, so uh, we should be going forward now, and all I have to do is, is, is live. That's all. So um, today I have... Uh, I got stories from, uh, oh God, maybe 15 or 20 of them. I have the Renee Wall Street story. I have the Kelly Jones Palm Meadows Gulfstream Park um, and Fair Hill Training Center. I have, oh, you know what story I'll tell today? Because I think last week I mentioned a couple of businesses that I was in um, between Modern Age Wall Systems and... Um, um, uh, Lenardi Design Furniture and um, Caseworks. Uh, he, he, here's another one. Um, in right around 2004, 2005, I got a hold of a, a, a friend of mine, and um, a friend of mine got a hold of me and said that there's this company, um, Hypoxico, the name of the company is Hypoxico. And they're in Manhattan. It was founded by a German guy, genius guy, and uh, and they 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 wanted somebody in the horse business. And I don't know how they got a hold of Don or myself, but uh, we made an appointment and we went up there. So we're sitting in a conference room. In the conference room was a big table with cigarette lighters all around, no ashtray, no nothing. And back then, it was only 15 years ago, whenever it was, uh, nobody could smoke in the buildings. And uh, so the guy comes in, everybody gets introduced. And I said, I got a question before we saw, what are all these cigarette lighters for? He says, take that lighter and go outside the door, and light it, and then come back. So I take the lighter, I go outside, it lights, I come back. He says, did it light? I says, yeah. He says, try to light it now. It won't light. And he pushes a couple of them. He says, try to light them. No. He says, uh, the reason it's not lighting is because this room is an epoxic room. I says, what's an epoxic room? He says, 20, 30% less oxygen. That's right. And um, he says, uh, and then he tells me the whole story, how the German guy invented it and everything. And, and right now, uh, he's, in, he's in Europe trying to... Um, Build apartment complexes and and mini and and, uh, um, and, and apartments uh, condos that are all epoxic, so they can never catch fire. He tried to do it here, but the whole um, sprinkler system companies are controlled by the mob. I guess when he tried it, maybe they still are. I, I don't know. How would they and, cook uh, on the stove too? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know, Jimmy. I, I don't. I didn't. I didn't ask for particulars. I. I only know what I was told. So I, I don't know. Maybe they had electric stoves. I have no idea. There you go. I. I, 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 I don't know. And, and I don't this care. This man knows. 
I can't get into everything. When somebody tells me something, it's bad. I, I can't remember it. So why do I have to, you're going to tell me about it, and then i got to go into other stuff so I'll never remember anything. Anyway. Anyway, the epoxy rooms. Yeah. So he was there trying to, he tried to do it here, but he almost got killed from the people that own the, uh, uh, the sprinkler system companies. It's all mob control, I guess. So he went to Germany, and that's what he was doing in Germany. But I found it very, very interesting. And the deal was, he wanted me, he explained to me, and he showed me proof. And I have it in, in my catalog, because I did get involved. Uh, that what football teams uh, practice in an arena that's an epoxic arena. What fighters train in an epoxic room, situa in gym. Michael Phelps has his whole house in an epoxic situation with the guy that won nine gold, gold medals, yeah. Gold medals. For swimming, right. And on and on and on and on. So he says, uh, I want to get into the horse business. So uh, he says, he, it's, it's a lot more complicated than just setting up uh, Michael Phelps's house. Uh, that's easy enough. You just seal it with the certain safeguards and everything else, and it's it's done. But with horses, you have the urine, you have the manure, you have yeah, they, they, many, many, many challenges. And they didn't know how to do it. Plus, even if they did know how to do it, they didn't know how to introduce it to other trainers and, and everything. So they says they make, make uh, me a partner, 50% of whatever I did pertaining to the equine business, meaning polo ponies, equestrian, racehorses, all of that stuff, we'd be partners. Okay, I, I agreed. Me and Don agreed. And okay. I knew I, I knew right where I was going to go with this thing, and it was at, at Fair Hill, uh, the thoroughbred. Fair Hill is a place in, in, uh, in Maryland. It's the largest. It's 5,000 acres. I think DuPont owned it, and they turned it into a, the biggest training center in the country, I think. And all the top trainers train their horses there. And um, and they're all bonds uh, that are individually sold for half a million, a million dollars each, and uh, and uh, it's it was the perfect place. So um, they write up the contract, and then I go back to sign the contract, and the contract reads uh, that um, it wasn't in small print because I I hardly uh, you know as long, I just look for an X and I sign my name. That's it. But the the thing the top part didn't say anything about partnership it didn't say anything it said it certain it said a commission and i says what 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 commission am, am i going to get well for every one that you sell you're going to give commission so commission only yeah i said but that's not what we said that's right. not what we said <laughs> and 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 when when you talk with me you can't say something that you ain't going to do and i won't neither if you say it, that means you can do it, and you're going to have to do it. And the right. same thing with me. So don't say nothing you can't do. And what you just, what's on here is not what you said. So forget about it. And he says, well, you know, you can make a lot of, we're either partners where I could use all your marketing material, everything that you have there pertaining to humans, football teams, special forces, uh, Green Berets, all of these. I want to be able to yeah, use all of this. Boxing gyms, then, whatever. Yeah, I, I want to be able to use all of that. Now, you're not going to let me use it? Okay, fine. I, I don't care. And the, the deal is off. So now, during that period of time, it was about a week while we were writing the contracts, I start investigating all, all of this stuff. And, and and I found out that I think it was the 1965 Olympics. So I'm not sure. I, I think it was 1965. All the all the gold medal win, winners came from high altitudes. And then I start looking up high altitudes, and I right. find, find out that right. high altitudes, if you go up 8,000 feet, 9,000 feet, the air is so thin that the body, the spleen produces more red blood cells. More red blood cells means more oxygen. More f than faster. And, you can and, go and, faster, and, right? And not that you can go <laughs> faster, you can go longer. You can go longer. And you can only go as fast as you were born to go, but you can go longer. There's more oxygen, you go There's longer. There's more endurance, in other words. Yeah, right. So now, 
So now I say to Don, Don, Don was a very smart guy, very brilliant guy. So we start putting everything together, and, and building an epoxic room was, was easy enough. The problem was that this German guy who invented had patents on everything that he invented, everything, all the, all the generators, all the, all the, the beds that he made, because you can have your, just your bed uh, made epoxic. But all the generators he made, they were, everything was patented. And, and so, so, so uh, the, the bottom line is this. We created, we did everything that he did. We created it and we bought generators that did the same thing as him for one third the price from China. And we, we built a horse stall, epoxic horse stall with all the generators and everything else. In fact, I'm going to give Tom, I hope I remember this, if not, it'll be on my website. I think it's already on the website. Uh, what the stall looked like and what all the equipment that that you needed to create the epoxic situation with all the safeguards. Also, uh, drainage systems and purify, pure, pure air systems to... Uh, so for take care of the urine and, and all of that. So that's what we did. We built the first one. And um, and at that time, I was training ho uh, some horses. I had just got my license back. I was training some horses for uh, that me and Don owned. And we put two horses that we had, a horse called Search, Search Mission, and Willettstown, one was a pay, no, they were both trotters. And uh, we stabled them in these stalls. And it, it, um, at that time, I was probably 70 years old, I guess, right around there. And um, I was, was training them, and uh, I, know, I noticed the difference. And I says, you know what, Don? I says, I'm going to put these horses into race at the Meadowlands. Now, the Meadowlands, for those of you who don't know, it's a premier racetrack. It's a mile racetrack. The top horses in the world are there, and the top trainers are there, and the top drivers are there. I says, and, and we're going to test this out to see if it, it really works. And um, I put both horses in, and uh, both horses win with me driving against the best guys in the country and the best horses. They both win. And um, so I knew that it, it was for real. So then one day, there's a guy, I can't, I can't remember his name. Um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a trainer. Oh, God. Um, I, can, I, I just can't remember his name. He had a horse. He had a horse. It, sh it should be down here. I'm looking here, but I I, I don't see it. Anyway, uh, the 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 horseman will, will know who I'm talking about. The horse's name was bon, something Bon or something like that. And uh, in fact, it's in the book. It's in the book. I should I should look in the book. But anyway, he had a horse, a three year old trotter. And this three-year-old trotter, he raced against the same horses. And all these three-year-old trotters were all eligible for the Hamiltonian, which is, takes place at the end of the meet, at the end of the Meadowlands meet. Right. And he could, never, he could never race with them. He always finished fourth, fifth, sixth, fourth, fifth, sixth, every race, every race, every race. He could never beat the top. You have to at least show, don't you, to be there? No, 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 no. They would, whoever's eligible for the Hamiltonian gets in, but normally there's less than 10 horses. So anyway, um, but he could never, he was eligible for it, he's going to be in it, and, but he could never beat the top four horses. The top four always finished one, two, three, four, uh, but he could never be better than fourth. But the, but the horse was owned by... Um, um, the horse was owned by um, uh, a guy who builds, uh, um, what do you call them plants, or the electric plants? Uh, um, instead of electric, they have these, uh, uh, anyway. So, um, a high, was it a hyperbole? What is it? Uh, nuclear, nuclear plants. 
He oh, builds nuclear, oh, nuclear plants. Nuclear plants. Yeah. I thought you meant plants, plants. He <laughs> builds nuclear plants. Okay. I found the thing in the book right near. The horse's name was Broadband. Okay? That's the horse's name. And the trainer was Noel Daly. He come over with his owner, this billionaire guy that builds nuclear plants, and they wanted to buy um they wanted to buy uh, one of the stalls. They heard about it and they saw me win them races with my two horses. So, um, in fact, here's the pictures of it right there. It's going to be on the. It's going to be on the thing. So anyway, um, so now um, we sell them the stall. Now, for a horse that could never be better than fifth against the same field of horses every week, his next start, he wins. Wow! His next because start, he was in that stall. Yeah. Wow. His next start, he. I think we sold him the stall for. I think seventy or eighty thousand. I, I don't know. With all the equipment, they're ready to go. And um, he wins the next start, next start, next start. And now comes the biggest race, the million dollar. I think it was a million and a half dollars. What the Hamiltonian? Hamiltonian. Right. Now he's in there. And uh, he wins. He wins the Hamiltonian. So they had a big party and everything else, and they, they, they couldn't. They couldn't bar. You see what this you stall have so did. Many electric stories, man. What this <laughs> were, what this stall did, did. This stall did exactly what epigen does. Epigen increases the red blood cells, so you carry more oxygen. And but it's illegal to give the horses. And it's dangerous because if you give too much epigen. Uh, it, it creates too many red blood cells, and then the blood turns to glue. So when you give epigen, you should be under a vet's control because the vet takes the blood every week and, see, and knows when to stop, when, how much to give him, otherwise the blood turns to glue and, and the horse dies. So um, uh, it's, it's dangerous. And, and many horses died because some trainers that don't know, they just keep giving up. Right, you've got to be under a doctor's okay. care. Right. With this situation, you, you don't have to be. It's it's all natural. The body just adjusts to, and we always to that put environment, the stalls. Right. We always put the stalls at at uh, ten thousand, ten to twelve thousand feet above sea level, where you can't light a match in there. But um, if you could do, let's say you could do. 10 push-ups. You go in the epoxic stall and you do two and you can't breathe anymore. But if you're in that epoxic stall for maybe 20 days, you'll be able to do... Now when you come out, you're like a super horse. You do like 60 push-ups. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's why all the fighters that train with this and all the... They, they become super, horse, super people. So anyway, um, so now we have, uh, we have this, this stall. So my my idea was to go to Fairhill, New Je Fairhill, Maryland, where that big training center is, and go to all of these wealthy, wealthy trainers, and they have individual bonds, and we made these stalls um, portable, where you could move them, so we can put place them any place, and it's perfect. It's not like a barn area at a racetrack where. Uh, the racetrack owns everything and they won't let you bring anything on and they're all in closed bonds. These, these guys own their, 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 uh, all their stalls, their bonds, and they can put these bonds any place they want, the epoxic stalls. So, and they're totally self-contained. So uh, my plan was to go down there and talk to all of these trainers down there, and uh, which I did. And... Uh, we brought, we had a stall ship down there, explained her, and then we start getting orders. But when we were getting the orders, we also got a call from the some guy from Saudi Arabia. And I have all of this information, which I'm going to give to Tom, and he's going to put on my website. So whatever I'm saying now, I'm going to have documentation and contracts yeah, you're gonna so it, it could right? be verified because people are going to think I'm full of shit. So, um, so now... Uh, we get this this call from this sheik guy and his attorney. They want, he has 1,200 horses in training, this sheik, whatever his name is. And I have the name, it's in the documents, but I, I don't know, I don't remember the name. 
and he wants uh, he wants uh, twelve hundred stalls, <laughs> and then he wants another thousand stalls for his camels. That's all, because they race camels too. So now I forget about everything else because this is like a billion dollar situation. Sure. So now I forget the thoroughbreds, I forget the staff, I forget everything, and we just concentrate on this for two years. All we do is go back and forth, design the whole thing, how we're going to do it, what we're going to do, everything we're going to do, how it's going to be shipped. We created everything. So you stopped gambling then? Stop what? Gambling at the time, right? I haven't gambled since 72. Right? Oh, okay. So uh, I f I'll fix races up to, to, to 78, but that, that has nothing to do with this. This is 10, 20 years later. So I don't go in order no more. I am all over the place. They're just individual stories that happen years apart. So anyway, we're making this deal, and now we're figuring out how to so we, we figured out how to shrink wrap it, which we have pictures of that. We figured out how to ship them. We figured out how many we have to make. We, we All of this stuff, we figured out the dollar amount and everything else. And then um, it's in the letter that I have that um, the, their attorney writes back that we're going to have to put a hold on this because the money had to go from their country to another country to another country to which Don was fixing all of that out all with the banks and everything else and then something couldn't work and the, we weren't going to ship this until the money got there and then something happened and after two years I says you know what Don Ryan, tell them to go fuck themselves fuck them and their camels <laughs> and everything else and that was the end of that story so that's another that's another um, uh, business that that that, that you mean I mean like f them and their camels toe. You mean, huh? <laughs> Everybody knows that joke. Good. Yeah. So now, I, I told them to go fuck themselves, and that was the end of that. So now I, I'm saying, um, so now just like everything else, the highs, the lows, the highs. So now I'm right back crashing again, and then I says, you know what? I'm gonna. I'm going to put together, which I have. I, in fact, I have the whole brochure. I'm going to put together an epoxic gym. I'm going to get a, a place that's maybe 3,000 square feet because my thing now is, because I don't want a job, I want to make money. I'm 83 years old. I just want to make a score. I'm not interested in having a job. So what I, I did was... I want a place like 2,000 square feet, tops 3,000, so I could franchise it. But the first one is going to be uh, my epoxic gym. And I wrote the whole thing out. And the f in, the, in this gym is going to be three 20 by 20 epoxic rooms. And they're going to... And the, one, the first one is going to be for beginners, the next one is going to be for higher-ups, and the next one is going to be for the serious people and Pilates and all of that other stuff. So um, I put together the whole thing. And then, just like anything else, anything that you look in the start or sell, you got to have... You gotta have you got to have marketing, advertising, and everything else. Right, right. And... Uh, uh, so I figure, how am I going to advertise this marketing and everything? So I says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the area where, say, there's a Gold's Gym and go in that complex and rent a store as close to Gold's Gym as you could. And then in the whole window, put down free seminar for the serious, only serious need, need apply. Uh, epoxic gym. So that would work great now with the uh, Will you listen multiple to me? fight with the... Yeah, just l l listen to me. With those fighters nowadays. Yeah, yeah, it'd work good at all the time. I'm telling you what I went through. Okay. I go to all of these places, and every place where there's a gold gym or an L.A. gym or whatever gyms it is, they all have a contract that... In that complex where they're at, and it was going to be great because if I'm right next door, I just put a big thing in the windows, free seminars for the serious only if you want to, you know, right. and just right. as an enticement, right? Right. And then 
I go to I go to all these stores, all all of these places, and they all have a contract with Gold's Gym, and in the contract it says that in this whole complex they could never rent another a store that has anything to do with fitness, weight right. loss, any anything like that. So now I'm back to zero, which means I have to go find a place someplace else, and then you need a lot of money to market. So you know what I did? I did this. And I opened the drawer and I put it in a drawer and that's where it stays today. Wow. But that's 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 a great idea. With these ultimate fighters, you'll still you'll still do a good Yeah, work I they there's a kid. There's a kid that he's a fighter. He's supposed to be pretty good. And um, I told him, I says, listen, why don't you just build have an epoxic room? Build a gym and where you train with the big bag and however you train, train in an epoxic situation. You'll never run out of gas. That's You'll right. never get tired. Your arms and nothing will, there wow. will be really no lactic acid well, build up. And galore. Nothing. Wow. Right. But his trainer, the guy who trains him, said, uh, I'm, I'm crazy, it won't work, and everything else. And I learned a long time ago that. If you talk to somebody and the guy, if you don't hit his hot button right away, don't even waste your time. Just forget, move on to the next guy. Right. So you could tell the kid was all excited, but the manager didn't want to, the trainer didn't want to do it. He says, uh, like, I'm, I'm nuts and everything else. So I says, okay, so good. Good luck in your career and I'll, I'll see you around. Yeah, but I really want to do it. Well, if you really want to do it, talk to your manager. And right. the manager wouldn't let him do it. So... That went in the same drawer as the uh, 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 everything else. The shame. So that's it. But so, someday, um, uh, so, something's going to happen. I hope it hurry up, Satin, because it's getting late. And um, the 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 movie deal I had with Sony Pictures and Village Roadshow um, in in twenty nine in twenty twenty, the COVID ended that. Their option got you know expired. So. They asked me to re-sign, and I said, if you, if you get right back on it, you know, I'm not 40 years old. And they said they couldn't promise that they get, so I didn't sign with them. Then I signed with um, with Nick Vallelongo and Frank Vallelongo. They're the ones that wrote the movie Green Book. Uh, Green, Book Green Book yeah. won the Academy Award and yeah. won the award for the best screen screenplay. It was about their father, who was my good friend, Tony Lip. So... They fly in from California. They're going to meet me. They, everything's in place. And f Nick had to go back to um, uh, 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 L.A. for a couple of weeks. So Frank calls me up and he says, Larry, he says, my brother got to go back. Can I stay with you for a, a couple of weeks? I don't know anybody here. And and the reason he said that was because when he first arrived, he came first. I picked him up at the airport, and he wound up staying at my house for a couple of weeks. Till he got, so we got along really well, and he loved the stories I told about his father. So when his brother was going, he says, you mind if I stay with you till he comes back? So I said, sure. He says, all right, I'll be there tonight. That was Monday night. He never shows up. Tuesday, he don't show up. I call, no answer, no answer. Thursday, I get a phone call. They found him dead in the street in the Bronx. What happened was before he come to pick me up, he picked up a hooker, Got some cocaine laced with fentanyl. Oh, he died right at the steering Jesus wheel of his car, Christ. and so that. So now I see his brother at the wake and everything, and his brother says, "Listen, I have to go back to California, straighten all this mess out." And uh, I says, "No problem." He says, "Here's my." I had his personal number anyway, but uh, if you need me before I get wow. back to you, call me. The next week, see, all good things happen, but then. Then, okay, so now the next week I get a call from uh, a friend of mine. He says, Barry O'Brien wants to meet with you. Barry O'Brien wrote 30 major, major TV series from Ali McBeal to all of them. All the top ones are his. He's the writer. And he says he wants to talk to you. So they shoot the uh, uh, Law and Order in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. I go to Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and I meet with him. And uh, he says, my writing stops, um, the contract is uh, until uh, the middle of April. He says, so the 1st of May, I'll be all finished up. We'll go to California, and I want to do your whole life story. I read your book. I want to do your whole life story in a TV series. Too much material, just like Pelleggi said, for a right. movie. 
So I says, okay, so May 2nd, we make all the arrangements to go and everything else, and then we get an announcement, uh, the writer's strike. So that's on hold. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I get I get there. It's like climbing an ice mountain. You almost get to the top, the and, and then you, sl you slide the right back The cream always rises to the top, Larry. Yeah, well, it's getting late, too. Your day is coming. It's getting late. It's getting late. That's it. I'll see you. I'll see well, you next week. Let's save a good story. Let's say the uplifting story for the next show. Folks, ladies, gentlemen, thank you for viewing in also to the podcast. If you like what you see, hit like, um, subscribe, and also make sure once you get that bell rung, you know that the new podcast is available with Larry and I on it. Again, thank you for tuning in. Good night and take care.